And let me pray, and then we'll, well, I'll do a bit of a recap to catch everybody up, and then we'll follow on to here. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you so much for the way it uh, speaks to us, Lord, that we hear your voice as we read uh, your word, Lord. We pray that this morning would be that very case, Lord. We're going to look at quite a challenging piece of scripture, Lord, about how you discipline us, Lord. But Lord, it is full of encouragement in that you're a good father to your children. And I pray, Lord, that we would understand that, that we'd embrace that, and that um, our depth of understanding of your, of your character and who you are um, would increase, we pray. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I thought, because it's been a little while, um, we would do a bit of a recap, because I'm sure, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure you all remember exactly what happened in the first 12 chapters of, uh, of Hebrews, and it's all fully ingrained in your brains, and it's all just gone in. Um, but since we've had a gap, I thought that we'd do a bit of a recap. So, my first question, a bit of a trick question, does anyone know who wrote the book of Hebrews? Ah. 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 <laughs> anybody know? No one knows. No one knows, that's right. Um, well, I think it was God. You've, oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, definitely true, definitely true. So, yeah, I've been so studying. Yeah, he's come, come back after the summer ready to get me. Um, some people think Luke, some people Barnabas, some people, people think Paul uh, or Apollos. Um, the unknown authorship, though, of Hebrews, don't let that shake its authority. Okay, um, Hebrews makes incredibly important theological contributions to the canon of scripture. Um, it's been sacred scripture since the late first century. Um, there was contention as to whether to put it into the, the kind of only on the basis of the of the authorship. Other than that, it's just full of incredible stuff. Um, it's themes. <coughs> it's themes. He, Hebrews clearly lays out um, the present and the very real priestly ministry of Jesus. If you were with us on our Sunday mornings a couple of weeks ago, uh, Tim uh, spoke brilliantly about the. Uh, how we are all um, we are all priests, and that we're all of our job is to spread the message of Jesus, and uh, how Jesus, um, a high priestly, uh, a high priest who stands in the gap for us now, and he intercedes for us. Hopefully, this will be triggering some of the Bible studies that we've done in the past. That Jesus is both the divine Son of God and completely human. In his priestly role, he clears the way for you and me to be able to interact with God the Father. So, if you remember. Under the old covenant, on the old system, the priest would stand in the gap. They would take the sacrifice, whether it be a goat or a pigeon, sometimes we talked about, whatever it might be. He would make the offering to put the people right with God. Yeah, but now we know Jesus has done that for us. And he is our, our priest and he was the sacrifice. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 4, which would have been a yonks back, but we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Which is an incredible truth, isn't it? And if you remember that throughout the big chunk of the beginning of Hebrews, does anyone remember, I'm probably stretching a bit here, a word that said a lot. It said 13 times throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, Happy word, a positive word. Where is it making it? Basically, it says Jesus is something compared to everything else. He is supreme. Supreme would be a, I can't ever say this, a synonym, synonym of the word I'm looking for, yeah. but better. That Jesus is better. So Jesus is better than the angels. And Jesus is better than all creation. Jesus is better than all the priests you've had before. Jesus is supreme, certainly would be an uh, even better word, that he is supreme. He's better than the angels. He's not just a messenger, but the very message itself, <coughs> offering a better hope than the Mosaic law. We've talked about at length the fact that after you've done your uh, sacrifice and that you are taken it to the temple, there was still always that hanging doubt that you were going to sin again. And Yom Kippur would have to come round again. The Day of Atonement would have to come round again. There was never a finishing. There was never a rest. No relaxation. Um, you know, it's done with. It's dealt with. It wasn't finished. The cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Um, so he's a better sacrifice than all the bulls, all the goats. We said before, thankfully, that this carpet is not sodden with blood and goats carcasses and sheep and all the things that we'd have and pigeons hiding because we're going to go kill them that jesus is our sacrifice he's dealt with all of our sin we don't have to 
uh, bring any more uh, sacrifices. Um, this message of the superiority of Jesus would have been so important to, to the Jewish believers. One of the, the main reasons for this letter, um, and scholars think to the, to the church in Rome, would have been directly to the Jewish people who were under that old covenant, then had found Christ, found his freedom, but then persecution was started and life was getting difficult and there was a tension to slip back. <coughs> like just go back to the old covenant because it's still going on in the temple. Like just go back to sacrificing and obeying and trying to be as, as strict on these laws as possible. The persecution will stop and I'll just go back to my old way. And, and the writer of Hebrews is petitioning and saying, oh, Jesus is the better way. Don't go back to the old way. Jesus is this new way and, and persevere, which is something that we will uh, look at. And really, another theme, just again, just to finish off this kind of recap, is this sense of, of, of idols, of the things in our lives that we might idolise. Whether it is being comfortable, whether it is not being persecuted, which you might think, well, that's not an idol, but being safe and being comfortable sometimes can be an idol. Um, and, and what the, uh, the letter of the Hebrews says, you know, whether it's technology, material wealth, um, even sometimes our families, uh, Jesus is better. Remove these idols and put Jesus in his rightful place. Um, written here, the letter to the Hebrews makes it abundantly clear that only one person deserves to hold the primary place in our lives, and that is Jesus. Jesus offers a better confidence, a better priest, a better covenant, a better hope, and a better sacrifice. This is our Lord Jesus, who we love and who we serve. The letter to the Hebrews shouts at the top of its voice, make Jesus your priority. So, that's a little bit of a recap from the last sort of 12 chapters, and now we're going to uh, jump into chapter 12. And again, we're going to read from the beginning of chapter 12, because jumping in at 5, uh, verse 5 is a little bit of a, a jump. So we'll read from the beginning of chapter 12. Okay. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance <coughs> the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, and he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Okay, and I just want to stop there. I did speak on this verse just before camp, um, this verse 4, but I just want to, uh, in my studying, I came across this, and I, for those that have been there for a while will know I love Spurgeon, and I read this, and I thought I need to say this. So just to cover verse 4 again, I know we've covered it, but I just want to cover it briefly again. Let me read this to you. So what Spurgeon says. Jesus is here delightfully called the author and finisher of our faith. In most of the arts, there is a division of labour. One man begins and another completes. There is scarcely anything that is completed by one man. But the stupendous work of our salvation was not only commenced, but it was also completed by the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Let us look to him then. This will help us to persevere unto the end, because he persevered to the end. Think how he wrestled, think how he ran, and let your consideration of him nerve you for your struggle and brace up every muscle of your spirit so that you will be determined that as he won, so will you by the divine help of him who is the author and finisher of our faith. It has not come to that yet with any of you who are now here. You have not shed your blood for Christ yet, for these are not the martyrs. <coughs> so can you be wearied and faint if you run with the footmen and then weary you ha sorry, and they weary you, how will you contend with horses? We ought to be ashamed of ourselves if we grow weary in a race that is so easy compared with that of the men and women who laid down their lives for Christ's sake. It has never come to a bloody sweat with you as with them, nor to death upon a cross as is his case. Show, shall the disciple be above his master or the servant above his Lord? Our trials are little compared with those of the martyrs of the olden times. Courage, brethren. These are small matters to faint about. Moreover, our, our chastening, chastenings, our chastenings, we'll have to debate over the pronunciation of that as we go on. Chastening and chastenings are love tokens from God. Let us not be alarmed by them. This last sentence here leads us very nicely into what we're going to discuss here in verse 5 onwards. This understanding of God's discipline. For it says, moreover, 
Our chastenings are love <coughs> tokens from God. Let us not be alarmed at them. So it's Spurgeon's belief that the discipline that God would put us through is not a, um, I read one example last night of a, I don't know, maybe you don't want to share this. Don't worry, I can delete it from the video. Was anyone, was hit at school? Did anyone get the cane? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's not it. I'm sure it wasn't fun. And uh, this example that I read was that a schoolmaster might just take bliss in just hitting a child to just discipline them. And this commentator put that God calculates and considers in his love every blow that he might bring upon us in his love and in his wisdom and his sovereignty it is not a thrashing around but as we read here we cannot deny the very fact that the scriptures talk about god disciplining us and i was talking to, uh, to isaac on the way here that sadly because perhaps we live in a time and i said to him i've got to be careful i don't get on the soapbox now and get diverted from the scriptures but we live in a time where people perhaps are not reading the scriptures so much so they're getting a one-dimensional view of god They've just they've perhaps vicariously picked up who God is. God is love. So God can never discipline. How could God discipline? That's not a loving thing to do. And then we read the scriptures and if we look, look at the Bible for more than 10 minutes, we realize that God is not just one dimensional. His love for us is multidimensional, as is our love for each other. <coughs> that if we focus just on one thing, both if we just think he is a guy in the clouds, going to lightning bolt us, and he's waiting for you to trip up, or say something wrong, or think something wrong, he's going to get you. That's wrong. But equally, it's incorrect to just think of him as some fluffy, fluffy person who just is happy with whatever you do. It doesn't matter. He loves you. Do what you like. Forget about holiness. Forget about purity. Forget about sanctification. Forget about becoming like Jesus. It's okay. <laughs> All right? So we've got to, we've got to work our, our way of correcting these things. And, and some of you may have not come across these verses before, but they're there. So we're going to, so we're going to read them. So verse 5, and it'll be up on the, on the screen. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. And I'm aware that's why I asked just before about whether someone, you know, whether you've had that horrible experience of being in school. I don't know, we'll not get into a debate of whether we think we should bring the cane back. I don't know, I don't know I've got mixed feelings about this. But, uh, <laughs> but um, our view of discipline might be distorted by our experiences in our lives. You may have been brought up with a mum or a dad who was very, very strict, who would never let you get away with absolutely anything. Again, God, by his grace, can help us to understand and again, by reading scriptures, and it's like who he is and the love that he has as our father and, he, and us as his children, he can be, hopefully it was modeled really well, but none of us is going to be perfect as parents. But we must understand that we've got to work on sometimes, sadly, separating what we know of our parents and what our father or mother did, and now our heavenly father. And that's not easy. That's something to, to work on if you experience a difficult upbringing. But firstly, I just want to get into um, a little bit of, um, of, of understanding of the, of the Greek, of what this is written, originally written here. I just looked up, forgotten. It says, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? And just looking into kind of what well, the original word there uh, for forgotten, there's a, there's a huge emphasis on the Greek of utterly oblivious. Have you, I, have you gone nuts? Did you not remember you were taught this? How, it's as if you've completely, not just forgotten, you need to forget your keys, I forget stuff all the time. At a wedding, just this weekend, I um, stupidly, although I've got it safe, um, I was given the marriage certificate, the freshly signed marriage certificate. If you know me, you do not give me documents of any kind. <laughs> I will lose them. I've lost countless weekend away forms. Countless checks that people have paid for the gathering or whatever event. I mean, the Lord has had to help me find them in obscure places or just pay out of my own money because I lost them. Um, anyway, the, not too much of that. But uh, I forget things all the time. But this, there's an emphasis. It's not just that you've forgotten. It's as if you never knew. It's as if you just didn't contemplate what you knew of God's love. And you knew it because it was written down in the scripture. Um, as we'll just look at in a second, this is taken from Proverbs chapter 3. The writer to the Hebrews is saying, guys, you're, you're living as if you never, you never knew his love. 
And we do that sometimes, don't we? We act as if we've just not only forgotten, but it's just, it's just not there. We're acting as if we don't know the love of our Father and how he loves us as his children. We're completely oblivious. So, so the writer is saying, have you totally forgotten? And uh, one commentator used the word, this ex exhortation, this encouragement that God said to you in his word. It's Proverbs 3, 11, 12, if you want to look that up. And it's not just here that we were, we're reminded to remember. Uh, I say often the reason we do communion, one of the main reasons we do communion every week, everyone, is to remind us. To not forget of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, to remind us of his love, to remind, to commune, to take part in, in uh, reminding ourselves of his great love for us. And throughout scripture, uh, we're told to not forget. 2 Timothy 1 6 says, this is, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Whatever gift that you might have, be reminded to work on it, build it, fan it into flame. Shove some kindling on it, pour some petrol on it, whatever you need to do, get it, get it moving, get it built up, don't let it, don't let it settle. 2 Timothy 2.14, remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words. Such arguments are useless and they can ruin those who hear them. Who loves to have an argument here? I'm not looking at this side of the room. <laughs> I love to have an argument, love to have a debate. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, depending on what the topic of the argument is. Um, but he's again reminding them, guys, if you're arguing over stuff that doesn't matter, remember. Romans 15, 15, even so, I have been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that all you, all, all you need is this reminder. For God, in how he's going to put this, our word, this word together, knows we're a forgetful lot, aren't we? And we, think, uh, we forget things and ultimately we can forget um, God's love for us and the truths that are within God's word. But again, stepping on my soapbox and then stepping directly back off again, make sure we know what God's word says first. Go to reading God's word to know what it says in the first place. Or oh, it's never even there to forget. All right. So forgetfulness causes a lot of unnecessary problems and heartaches. Let me read this to you. One commentator says this, our greatest need, this is a challenging word, our greatest need is not for new light from God, but for paying attention to light we already have. When God's word is neglected, it is for God. Sometimes the answer or the help we need is in a truth we learned a long time ago, but have let slip away. And often, just to bring us back to the topic at hand, often the lessons that we've learned from God are from the times of struggle or suffering or difficulties. Then God's sovereignty, perhaps in a part of his discipline, which we'll talk about, come about. Uh, but we've forgotten about them. Perhaps we've just, and I, I, it's difficult because suffering is a, a huge spectrum of suffering, everybody. And there are things that I would not wish to, to rebuke you for, for saying, I just want to forget about that. Because there are certain things that I have no judgment of you at all. But, but it's remembering what did God teach me in those moments? What did God teach me in those moments? What were the things, whether it's his love, his faithfulness, his commitment to me, the fact that it was so difficult, but he got me through. Yes, let us not dwell on the, on the hardship itself, but on what God has done in it and through it. Remember, don't forget. See, these believers weren't seeing their afflictions uh, through the lens of God's word. They were looking at it from a fleshly personal perspective, perhaps. Oh, woe is me, it's been done to me. And it's hard, everyone, but instead to look at it, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me here? What can I learn about you? What are you trying to mold? What are you trying to chip off to make me more like Jesus? They had forgotten more than simply divine truths. They'd forgotten that they had a loving heavenly father. And this is such a crucial point to this piece of scripture, everybody, that we must understand that he is a father and we are, are his children. And that he loves us and, and he loves us so dearly. And you probably heard the quote that he, he loves us so much, he's not willing to leave us as we are. <clears throat> that it wouldn't be love just to leave us idolizing technology, stuck in front of the TV for hours, whatever. Stuff that we might think is pleasurable and fine. And Lord's like, that's not my joy for you. I want, I want to remove that idol. And it might be painful. It might really hurt that habit you've got, whatever it is. I want to help you to not do that any longer because it's going to hurt you. And I, I want to give you true joy in me. But we don't see it that way, do we? We cling on. We think he's a... 
we can sometimes think, oh, you're just causing me to be a boring life. It's fun. I want to do this thing that I find pleasure in. We've said before, everybody, that the, the, one of the major uh, problems with sin is that a great deal of it. We can just think it doesn't harm us and it's fun and I don't have a problem with it. I'm not hurting anybody, but God loves us so much. He's like, but you're hurting yourself. You're hurting us, yourself. St. John of the Cross, as some of you may have heard of, wrote this, God perceives the imperfections within us and because of his love for us, urges us to grow up. His love is not content to leave us in our weakness. And for this reason, he takes us into a dark night. He weans us from all the pleasures by giving us dry times and inward darkness. In doing so, he's able to take away all these vices and create virtues within us. Through the dark night, pride becomes humil humility. Greed becomes simplicity. Wrath becomes contentment. Luxury becomes peace. Gluttony becomes moderation. Envy becomes joy. And sloth becomes strength. No soul will ever grow deep in the spiritual life unless God works passively in that soul by means of the dark night. And I hope that we can testify that to, our, to our, in ourselves as well. When are the times you've grown the most, everyone? Think, when are the times you've known growth in your spiritual walk, in your faith? And I would mention, I would wager that it's been times of, it's been tough and it's been a struggle and you've suffered, but, you've, but God has been working in you something great. Billy Graham, one of my heroes says, I truly believe that the lot of those that suffer is more envi enviable than the people who seem to be set apart, untouched, like a piece of fine china in a lock cabinet. Without dark clouds in our lives, we would never know the joy of sunshine. We could become callous and unteachable if we do not learn from pain. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes each one he accepts as his child. I just want to briefly say, this is an important thing. When we read punish, what comes to mind? A big stick. A big stick, yeah. yeah. It's negativity. Negativity, yeah. Yeah. Any others? Hurt. Hurt. so important we must understand the meaning of this word here because the English language doesn't do it justice at all if I can find them all just stretching out here punish discipline discipline again there the original Greek here the connotations of the word are intrinsically connected to the raising of a child all right uh, well if I hear punish I instantly think something like you're being tortured or hurt or You've been caught doing wrong and that person's going to get you. Zero grace, zero mercy. But the original language, it creates connotations of just the training of a child, bringing a child up in the way that they should go in a loving manner. Not in a, going to hurt that child for, the, for just the sake of being hurt, but training them up, helping them grow, teaching them right from wrong. This is what uh, this, this is talking, this is what it's talking about. It's not <coughs> such loving language as it, my child. Don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. Sorry, correct as well. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. So we've got to remember when we read this, I know it's quite difficult because you'll immediately sort of think, oh, the negative, the punishing, God's kind of harshness. But the language isn't doing justice that it's the same as a, as a parent would think upon how they can train their yeah, child. Almost, oh. that, the idea of bringing up children, discipline, Challenging, saying no, that's not good, don't do that again, could be looked on upon as, ah, don't do that, that's wrong. Of course the extreme, everyone, of, of, of bordering on abuse or into abuse is completely and utterly sinful and wrong. But if any of you have been around a child for more than 10 minutes, left to their own devices, they're not little angels. <laughs> they're not angels. Um, like, I can really tell you, I should have reminded we went out to Mikey Carroll's last night, and we don't know where it came from, but Eleanor decided that we should take the doors off. She wanted to take the doors off. Now, she didn't physically try to take the doors off, but she was like, guys, come on, let's take the doors off. It was hilarious. We're like, Eleanor, what? We're not, not taking the doors off. She was like, oh, come on, let's take the doors off. <laughs> anyway, so there are destructive ways that Eleanor would, uh, I don't know if she's seen it on TV or something like this, but anyway, she wanted to take the doors off. 
Um, it was hilarious. And then she was like, oh, come on, please, let's take the doors off. Um, and I was just, you know, it left oh, to your own devices know. with a screwdriver. You'd be doorless. <laughs> you should be running out the room with all the doors. Our kids are beautiful and wonderful, and, and, we, and we adore them. Gifts from God. But also, without instruction, without correction, without discipline, then there is no training, and, the, and, and for their own sake, everybody, and this is the point that we must get to, for their betterment, for our betterment, for our joy, for our understanding and knowledge, we need to be guided by our Heavenly Father. We need to be told that's not good, what you're doing. Stop doing that, please, for your own sake. And he is infinitely patient with us. Infinitely patient. And his grace abounds and abounds and abounds to us but all the while as a father would if his child just keeps on doing something really dangerous would do anything that he can to persuade them please stop doing that you're going to hurt yourself please stop doing that that, that way of thinking that the words you're speaking those actions are, are, are damaging and this is this is our god he isn't just one-dimensional he isn't just going to agree with everything that you think and do. We're, we are but dust, clay, the hands of the potter. And yet some, sometimes we might think, oh, I just know what's best for me. God knows what's best for us. God knows. John MacArthur, some of you will have heard of, said, says this, the systematic training of children. It includes the idea of correction for wrongdoing. This is of these words, as I've just mentioned. It includes the idea of correction for wrongdoing, as seen in the well-known proverb. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. In the several uses of the term in Hebrews 12, the translators of the authorised version rendered it. Is it chastening or chastening? chastening. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> chastening, chastening, which is clearly the emphasis of that context. Paul's meaning here is expressed even more fully. However, in the proverb, train up a child the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It is also clearly emphasized. It's a hope that we're understanding. Because when we read this, without this perhaps this understanding, we could read it and just, and, and, and perhaps the enemy would wish to just convince us, oh, God wants to punish you. God wants to hurt you, he's angry with you. Think along the lines, whenever you read this again, Think upon how the father lovingly would help their children grow up, okay? Verse 7. As you endure the divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? <laughs> Perhaps we can think of lots. I don't know. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits <coughs> and live forever? There's five things, actually we'll just keep reading, there's five things I want to mention just from this section of scripture. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening, it's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. So five things just to kind of highlight from um, the scriptures that we've read so far. Verse six, God's discipline is evidence of his love for us. Again, just to reiterate, that might not be the, your understanding of discipline. Someone disciplines you, corrects you, one of the word punishes you, your opinion of that person could be very one dimensional. They are just a nasty person and they're angry with me and I don't like them. But God's discipline is evidence of his love for us. As we've just said, he's molding us, that we are not left to our own devices. Without the Spirit's help, we will go our own way and do our own thing and it will be good for us, but with God's help, so God's discipline is his evidence of his love for us. God's discipline assures us that we are his spiritual children, genuine members of his family. Can anyone think of a time 
where they've been aware, and you don't have to share it, but been aware of God kind of picking you up and putting you back where you should be. I always in my mind visualize like a train track and I've derailed. And in his, in his love, he's gone, whoop, get back here. <laughs> what are you doing over there? <laughs> Come over here. But um, like, I mean, the scriptures talk of us, we're like sheep, aren't we? Who will go off and stray. And all of us will, will do this in, in, and at times, and then God will patiently and graciously and lovingly bring us back. If we are his, everybody, this is the emphasis here. If we are his, if we are his children, we can have confidence in knowing that he will not let us wander so far. He will bring us back. Um, and it could be, I mean, look at the prodigal son. It could be covered in pig poo and desiring to eat pig food and you've been humbled and you've been broken, but your father embraces you and hugs you and forgives you and only ever desired that you'd come home that was all he ever wanted so god's discipline assures us that we are his spiritual children genuine members of his family thirdly <coughs> god's discipline says to us god deserves even more submission and respect respect than our earthly fathers as god has even more of our good in mind this is a staggering thing that even the most loving father, I hope I love my kids as mu and as I can possibly. I, I could, in my head and heart, don't understand how I could love any, anything, anybody or any, any more. You know, I feel like I've exploded with love for some of them, and they're so cute and little at the moment, so it's dead easy. But you, you can't imagine loving them more. God loves us more than that. He loves my kids more than I love them. He loves you. You know, in a staggering, staggering amount. And therefore, has our good in mind even more so than the most loving, brilliant dad you can possibly imagine. However, he might think, I am I'm the best dad. I've read all the books. I know how to be the best dad. I've got all the techniques. I know how to grow, help them grow, help them do well at school, help them be amazing sportsmen. Whatever it is, he goes like, no, 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 no. I know how to do it better. I know I've got, I'm your father, I know how to father you better, and I know what's good for you even more than you might even think. You picture in your heads uh, your children and think of the good that you want for their lives. God's like, I know what's better for them. I've got even more good for them. Which therefore means we would submit to that. We bring respect for that. Yeah. The fourth. <coughs> this is a huge one, everyone. You could do a whole series on this. God's discipline enables us to share his holiness. That's, top, that's the first 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. How does, how does discipline result in holiness? Any ideas? You become set apart, cut off from the world. Yeah. Yeah, so you might be, you might, you know, discipline on something that you are in that you shouldn't be in. God's like, I need you out of that. I need you to be set apart, I need you to be holy. Yeah, yeah. What else? How else does it? I think it, it helps us or it makes us lean on Him more heavily Definitely. because we're being disciplined. Yeah. We know that He's the only one who's going to right. give us all right. that we have. That's a very helpful picture because <laughs> weirdly, Again, go back to our school analogy. The last thing you're going to want to do is find comfort in the one hitting you with the cane, are you? <laughs> They're the, but with our Lord, because of his love, we're almost clinging to him, yet understanding, I see you're doing this for our own good. That's hard, everybody, isn't it? That's a weird thing to think about. But the very one who we understand is allowing this to happen to us for our own good, we also, as you said, we lean on, we find comfort in, we find peace in, which we'll get to as we get to the end of this section, that a harvest will be brought about from this disciplining, from this struggle, from this suffering, a harvest will come about. But God's discipline enables us to share in his holiness because quite honestly, everybody, again, we're not predisposed to, <coughs> to holiness. It's a sanctifying journey throughout life of becoming more like Christ. And there'll be things, even in the most holy of people that you can think of, that God still wants to help to pull out. And uh, if you remember a few weeks ago, I hope I'm getting this right way around, uh, when Mike talked about um, who made David the sculpture? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. 
And he was asked, how did you turn that piece of marble into David? And he just said, I took everything out that wasn't David. Mm -hmm. I loved that. Mm -hmm. I was like, all I remember from that talk is that. <laughs> That's blowing my mind. I was like, what an illustration. Took everything out from the marble that wasn't David. And that's like, God, he's taking everything out of us that isn't who we truly should be, like Christ. Get, I need that away, I need that away. I'm going to chisel, mold, turn this into as physical a specimen as David. I'm not seeing Has anyone seen David in the flesh? No. There you go. So he's doing that anyway. He's chiseling us and he's molding us to share in his holiness. And again, it's not always uh, fun, as we've, as we've said. It's not always easy, it's painful, but he's doing it for our own good. Um, I've shared this before with you. Uh, when I run on my treadmill, I've asked before, we've got runners, haven't we, Sarah? Has anyone any of you runners? <laughs> Helen, runs too. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't run outside, exclusively indoor runner. <laughs> and uh, therefore, I can have my iPad on the treadmill because it'd be dangerous to run around outside like this. <laughs> and uh, I can watch like motivational videos that like really psych you up. <laughs> push you to go that, that bit further. And one of them that I... Nah, nah, I wouldn't do the job. I need to be battered. Feel for creation, isn't it? I need to be shouted at by these like very muscly men who are like, keep going! Yeah, I know. There's one guy, he's not his job, he's actually like an interviewer guy, a podcaster, uh, called Joe Rogan. But he has one, he has one, where he basically says, he says, what people get wrong is pain is good for you. Do something every day that's uncomfortable. Do something every day that's difficult. Uh, you only, it's basically says you only grow, this is me running, I'm exhausted, I'm on like 5K, I'm like, do something that's difficult, do something that's hard, that gives me motivation to keep going. Um, because it will produce in its positive effects, that, um, think of it, physical training, you know, the fit, you know, I've been pondering upon it. I was to a podcast recently of why pastors should take their exercise seriously, which was, you know, it's an interesting topic. And just the very fact of being being physically fit means that if someone rings you in the middle of the night, you get out, you can get out of bed and get to the bedside, and you're not, you know, you're not feeling like death. You're like you're, you're physically in a position where you're actually like, I can get up, I can go, I can help, I can serve. You do long days. These are these are important things. Anyway, shall we test that out? Don't. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I will come. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, there's a, the spiritual dimension to everything, isn't there, everybody? And, and that, that training, which is painful, so sometimes I'm doing it for the church. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really matter me that much. But no, that God's discipline enables us to share in His holiness and to, to share in, in the joy of following Him. All right? Next, moving on. God's discipline <laughs> yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Verse 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening, it's painful, but afterward there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. And, and it will produce peace, everyone. Something that breaks my heart is seeing people that are not at peace. And they might, they might know Christ, but they're, they're not, still not at peace. Still clinging on to things that they think give them peace, or understandings that give them peace, but they don't. I was talking to someone last night and I was just saying, I said this expression a lot, I think it was Albert Einstein who said this, but the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. <coughs> and people get stuck in these circles and ways of thinking and, they, and they're not from what the scriptures say, but they're just, I'll just keep thinking this or I'll keep doing this, even if it's not working, God was like, come to me, cast your burdens on me, come and learn my word, absorb it in your, in your mind, this will give you peace, this will help you in holiness, this will keep you on the right path, it'll be a light to your path, you know, these are the things that, that God has clearly put down for us, and do work, they're not just pithy statements, they transform your life, um, they yield a peace, the peaceful fruit of righteousness in our lives, it's discipline, I was about to say, who's ready for some discipline? <laughs> so that we can hopefully encouraged. <laughs> that it's not something, as you say, it says here, it's not something that we seek for. It's not something that we might look look out for. Lord, I want, want to be disciplined today. That's not the attitude, but it is understanding that if there is suffering and times where you realize God is correcting you and bringing you into line with how he wants you, that, that you can understand it, see it through that lens of God's word, see it through the lens of God's sovereignty. That he's working on you. 
And the Amplified, which I, I like, uh, verse 11, says this, For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The harvest of fruit which consists in righteousness, in conformity to God's will, in purpose, thought and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. I should probably always put amplified bits up on there because they're very wordy, aren't they? But it brings conformity to God's will, in purpose, thought and action, resulting in right living and right standing with God. A.W. Tozer, some of you, um, I'm trying to think of the book that I love. Pursuit of God. Thank you. Isaac, Pursuit of God. Everyone read Tozer's Pursuit of God. Incredible. Well, all of his books are brilliant, but that, I love that. Said it is doubtful if God can bless a man greatly without hurting him deeply. That's a strong statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's doubtful if God can bless a man greatly without hurting him deeply. Again, it's that carving, that moving, that molding. This, I think this is from an old hymn. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. So have you ever heard of Andrew Murray? Yes. Yeah, oh, that's a great reaction. Well, he's <laughs> South Africa, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. Um, he says, observes that these two expressions that we have here contain the great contrast between time and eternity of the visible and the invisible, of sorrow and of joy, of sense and of faith, of backsliding and of progress to perfection. Yet afterwards, to throw away eternity into the balance and judge everything by that, this is what even the patriarchs did. This is what Christ taught us, when for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. This is what faith can teach us in every trial. Yeah, I love that. I hope that as we're nearly, nearly done for the day, that this is reinforcing and helping us to have a much more robust foundation to look at our, our struggles and our sufferings and, our, and God disciplining us. That it is producing in us a greater glory, a greater image for the surrounding world of who Christ is. It is not meaningless, it has a great purpose. 2 Corinthians 4, favorite piece of scripture says this, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. I'd rejoice over that scripture. I'm so glad that's in there. <laughs> As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. What's seen? <coughs> Pain, suffering, sweat on a treadmill. That's very seen. <laughs> Not enjoyable. But hopefully, it's doing me good. Look to what's unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So verse 12. So, take a new grip with your tired hands. And strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. The author ends this section here, uh, speaking from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 and 8, which reads this. Strengthen your weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, it shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if, even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. What an encouragement for fools. I'm a fool. <laughs> but I'll not go astray. God will help, help us. Ending here is this assurance that the discipline and suffering will bear fruit everyone. That it has a purpose. That it is not meaningless. 
And God will have his way. He'll get us to where he wants to get us to. I just often think we'll either get there kicking and screaming <laughs> or we'll get there walking alongside him. Yeah. Um, there's like, I know the Footprints poem, if that's what you'd call it. I love that. I had like a six foot version in my uni room. It's huge version, like took up a whole wall. And, uh, but I saw a comic, um, ver a comic book like version of it, just a picture. And you know the bit where it says, and where there was only one set of footsteps, yeah. it was there that I carried you. Yeah. And this version is like this like messed up sand, there's like a trench, and it's like, the, and he says, it was at this moment that I dragged you kicking and screaming. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, really, it's true, isn't it? It's not often we just say, uh, Lord, carry me. It's like, get off, Lord, I don't want to do this. He's like, come, come on, and he'll you, get you through it. I love that. I think that's probably more true uh, to reality. Uh, to finish, let me read this. I'm not sure who wrote this, but it's like, a, it's a poem. I, I love it. You can ask, if you would like a copy, I can give it to you. It says this. It's about a father taking his daughter to buy a, a doll from a toy shop. I promised a doll to my dear baby girl. I had pictured a figure most fair, with exquisite features and teeth of pure pearl, moving eyes, walking limbs, and real hair. We entered a shop, and the sweet little maid clasped, I get quite emotional in this. <laughs> we entered a shop, and a sweet little maid clasped a cheap, tawdry doll to her chest. To make the exchange, I was really afraid, though I wanted to give her the best. I took her away, and the tears filled her eyes, but I gave her the one I had planned. The dear little face glowed in joyous surprise that a treasure existed so grand. O oh, Saviour, I too am a child in thy sight, and I choose the first things that I see. I struggle to keep them. I do not, I do not know quite why the Father should take them from me. But when I look back through the wisdom of years, when my faith is age old and sublime, I know I shall see through a rainbow of tears that my father planned best all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me pray to finish. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can trust that the difficulties that we may be going through are far from meaningless, far from without purpose and far from without hope. Lord God, that you are training us in godliness, that you're training us in holiness, Lord. And I pray that we wouldn't turn away, kind of go kicking and screaming, even reject you, Lord, but we would understand that your love is more multidimensional than we might sometimes give it credit for, that you will have your purposes behind uh, the veil often, Lord. And I pray that you would uh, remind us of that fact, the cross on that day looked very <coughs> hopeless. Your cross, Jesus, looked like things were over, that you were defeated, but you were far from it, Lord. And I pray that we remember that as well, that in times where things look hopeless, in times where we think, what are you doing, Lord? That you are infinitely at work, mm -hmm. that your hands are still as tight in our hands as they've ever been. Give us courage, Lord, give us strength. Uh, to keep going one step at a time i pray for your glory and for, as we've been reminded this morning for our infinite joy and for our betterment i pray in jesus name amen, amen. amen. amen.